Kennedy. <laughs> that was real big at home. Oh, man. There was that one night, too. I put a headset on her. I was talking to her. Mm -hmm. She was so confused. She's like, Mommy, where are Annie at? <laughs> She's got the croup, so she's at home today. I almost brought her. Just spread the germs. Now, how old is she? She's two. Oh, so she's at a good, at a good stage. Oh, yeah. Um, so they've had a couple of very bad disasters <laughs> with croup and RSB, the real little ones. They've had two cardiac arrests, a two-month-old and a five-month-old <laughs> that had RSB. Was charged all and was found in a restaurant four hours later. So I know she. Uh, it was the night before last. She woke up and I heard the call, and I was in the living room. I was like, "Something. This is not right. This is not right." And I rushed back there, and she was in respiratory distress, but she has an at-home nap machine. So I gave her the at-home nap. We put her in the shower, got the hot water going, and then we called the on-call keys, and they're like, "Yeah, put her in the morning." I figured we had not had the machine there and actually knew what to do because it was me, the boyfriend's paramedic. I think we go pretty screwed. Like, the average person might have just said, oh, it's okay, I'll just put you back to bed. It was really not ideal. Poor baby. Is it right at seven? It's almost. The camera's on, I think. How you been? I haven't seen you in a while. Good. Just that, just good. Are you on the mountain still? And not at all? You abandoned them? Yeah? I gotta get going. They're my favorite volunteers. Oh, man. They're good people. That's what people see at home. They'll see us and then they'll see the actual presentation on the screen. That's why I have two laptops hooked up. Okay. Whatever. This was like a, was it like a 45 minute thing of her trying to explain how these things work? Who, Annette? Yeah. Yeah. Once you get it though, it's pretty easy. Mm-hmm. But, boy. So before this thing starts, I could probably isn't kicked on yet. Um, so how do you guys usually do this? Like, what's the what's the way that you guys do this? Do what? Do you, like, you guys prepare for the class before you come? Oh, this is my first time coming here, so I don't know. I'm just uh, sitting in for CU. Who's the normal one? Usually she talks. We look at the slides. There's a question and answer portion of it. Which slides? Whatever she's setting up. Okay. I do a PowerPoint. Like a short PowerPoint. You do like just okay. So I did too, but you don't. Do you use the powerpoints that come with the the program? I have to make them. Okay. Like, I literally read the chapter, I take notes, and I summarize it. and I put it in a powerpoint so that people that don't have the book still have access to the material. Okay, and see, I didn't have the book, so I didn't know like what is that the book you're using? Yes. Oh, I have that book at home. I wish I'd realized that. Yeah, this one is uh, it's really good. I also have the ASN. A-S-T-N-A -A book. But I literally just summarize it and make notes and then I send them to people. So that way everybody's got access to the material even if they don't have the money or the resources with them. Because these books are kind of expensive. Like Yeah, I didn't realize that I have that book at home. Oh man. I wish you had said that. I would have just opened it up and done my own thing. I am so sorry. That's alright. Oh, I was like, that's I don't even have a book. But I do now. And then the other books... Last week we did a roundtable discussion. We did something completely different. We literally, I took pictures of this book and I put them up on the PowerPoint screen. And we sat down and we discussed the rationale and answer, the, the questions, the answers and the rationale behind them for like some of the ventilator questions and some of the ABG stuff. It was me, Paul, Scott Grant, and one other person. 
we just sat here for an hour and a half talking it through and talking through the rationale and the questions. So it was a lot of interesting material. Because I wanted to do something different. And I was like, okay. We've got these resources, so. And that's what's up. It's on the share drive art. It's under pre-work. There's practice questions. And there's highlighted questions and answers with rationale that are from these books. It's just pictures of the pages because they're really hard to scan. <clears throat> so, we can either wait for Scott or we can go ahead and start recording. So, um, he says run them out late. I haven't clicked the like flag it button yet to let them know that we're ready. He was working in the ER today. Yeah, he just he texted me and said he's going to be about five minutes. They looked like they was pretty full when we was over there. Yeah. Everything's ready to roll when you are. Okay. And the mouse that you're operating operates the screen. Art, can you hit one of the light switches over there? So it kind of. Do I have a mouse there or do um, I mean, I'm going to stand up anyway, but yeah. I just okay. wanted to do. Um, you're clicking will operate Which this one. Which one do you here. want to damn this one? That's fine, yeah. Just so we can see. And then I'll do the computer and have them up here. I usually stand right here so I can click. click. Oh, you're one of those. All right. So I didn't make a whole lot of slides. I only made like 20 slides because I, I think that we're just going to be able to talk through and it will make sense. And then a lot of the stuff will kind of um, fall, fall into its own. The lab values, like some of these from a critical care perspective, some of these have no bearing on anything on what you're going to do, but there are some that are really important to understand and know. Okay, um, I broke it up so that we'll do the lab stuff first and talk about how to, um, if you find these lab values off, what kind of things should you be thinking about, what type of treatments do you want to implement or get implemented, um, and then we'll go into the ABGs after and hope, because I think ABGs are really not that hard, although there are some people that find them pretty hard. I don't, I don't think they are once we get the sense of like how they work. Um, so my, I guess my question is, how familiar are you guys with these labs so far? Are you familiar with them at all, what they do? Where, where, like if a nurse at home calls and says, hey, you know, the patient's got abnormal labs, we're going to the ER. Like what kind of labs are you going to be concerned about in the field that you think are going to make a big difference? Any of the cardiac ones, yeah. like, like what? Potassium. Okay. I've read up a lot about the white count, about the H and H levels, and I took a class and learned ABGs. Okay. So it was in there, but still, because I, I wanted to know what those were. Okay. All right. So we will touch on those uh, briefly. So cardiac labs, the potassium is one. CKMB. We don't use it anymore. So there are a number of labs that came through that you sent me that are like, no, nope, we don't use those anymore. Um, CKMB is one of those okay. that we won't that we won't uh, even talk about because uh, if a hospital um, draws it, they clearly have a doctor that's been working longer than 30 years because that's how old that is. What else? One of the labs. Joy. I mean, the nursing home's not going to give us a troponin, but you'd be concerned about that if someone has an all okay. troponin. But what are things that they do give you that make you go, ooh, wow, this could be serious? Potassium is definitely one. Sodium. Sodium is very, very, very important. Calcium. Yeah. A lot of times I just get white counts. They always just spit out a white count number. They don't know what it means, but they just spit it out first thing. Okay. So why don't we start there then, since that's you brought it up now twice. Let's start there, because they do. They do get a white count. They do get blood counts, and they're like, oh, this is off. They have to go. What does a white blood cell count mean? A lot of things. 
Uh, Let me ask you truly, what does it mean? It means that they have an elevated level of immune system response cells in their system. So that could mean anything from? from infection to cancer. Cancer to infection. To a bowel trauma. Inflammation, stress. It could be a million anything. things. And I can tell you truly the white count is not anything that you're going to use for anything in your critical care um, arena. And half the time, one of the things we do with the residents, they'll say, I'll say, All right, what do you want to draw? And they go, okay, we'll get a CBC. I say, okay, for what? And they go, well, I'd like to get a white count. Okay. So the white count's normal. What are you going to do? Hmm, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, if the white count's really low, what are you going to do? Nothing. Yeah, I guess that's a good point. What if it's really high? It doesn't necessarily mean infection. It can mean a million things. So the white count is one of those things that we kind of get every time we get a blood test and in some cases can lead us down a path um, of a diagnosis, but doesn't always. I mean, people have sepsis with a normal white count. Oh, people don't have sepsis with a white count of one million. You ever see a patient with a white count of one million? The, that uh, would probably blow your socks off. For the sepsis, the lactic, the lactic count is... That's one of the, one of the tools we, you, we do use, but what you, you got to remember with all of these labs and people that you're dealing with, what's the factor you have to take into account? Their history? Kind of. How old the labs are? I'm sorry, that was me. That's true. That's true. That could be two days old. That could be a week old. It's hard to say, but the, the important thing about labs is that you're dealing with people. Okay, and everybody has a different response to the stressors they have in their body. So elderly people don't mount a white count. Young kids mount a white count very easily. Okay, so the, this is the thing that we've got to make sure you understand that some of this stuff, you're dealing with elderly population, it's a different setting, it's in different settings. You deal with young kids, it's in different settings. So make sure you understand that the values are what they are, the ranges are what they are. And being out of the range, we're going to kind of walk through what does being out of the range mean and what, what does that concern us? Why would we be, be concerned? All right, so let's just start with, we mentioned sodium. That's really kind of a crappy slide. I didn't think that would come out quite this bad. But we have sodium. You, can you tell me the normal range before we go anywhere? 135 to 145. One what? 135 Yeah. So also, that's the other thing is when you find you get labs, you go in and out of places, you get the labs, see what their ranges for their lab Everyone's is. Changes. So it's you're around 135 to 145 is a normal range of serum sodium, right? right. Serum sodium. Okay. So sodium is really important to uh, ion because it affects so many things in our body, like what? Cardiac cycle? Yep. Muscles. It's, I mean, it, it, brain, literally, everything. your brain, it's really your ATP, sodium potassium pump, all of that's involved, and sodium plays a big part in that. So, what do we want to do? There are three categories of sodium depletion that we want to deal with. The first one being is uh, sodium between 120 and 125. Any idea how that happens? Yep, and the interesting thing is it can be when people get dehydrated, and again, you want to remember this, when they get dehydrated, they can either drop their sodium or they can concentrate their sodium. So sometimes they're 145 to 155 and they've had nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea for the last week. That just tells you I'm hemoconcentrated, I've lost a lot of fluid, but I haven't lost a lot of my sodium. And yet the answer is still the same treat them with fluids. Okay, so 120, 125, that in, and most of the time, the signs and symptoms that will go with that, people will just have this overall, I just don't feel well. As they say down here, I'm tired. I'm tired. You're tired? Oh, my God. And then you take their blood work, and it's mostly elderly that are like this. You take their blood work, and their sodium is 120. What else can cause a drop in sodium? Is it a rise in one of the other electrolytes, like rise in like calcium? Mm -hmm.
fluid it's volume access medical can. problems, huh? Fluid volume access can, like, if you're retaining enough fluid, it's not going to be as concentrated. Okay. Yep, so sometimes people can drink enough fluid that they can dilute themselves out or they're not, you know, getting rid of fluids as balancing out so they'll, they'll actually have hemo, uh, hemodilution. But there's another interesting cause, and I think a lot of people forget about this, but any time you have something in the chest, cancer, any kind of tumors, pneumonia, um, that kind of a thing, in the chest you actually get a kind of SIADH. That it's not uncommon for somebody with a big pneumonia or really bad COPD to get that that axis, that hypothalamus, renal axis off, and they actually have low sodiums because they've got a lung cancer or they've got bad COPD or they've got a bad pneumonia. That will drop people's sodiums pretty quickly. So that's a very mild hyponatremia. We don't necessarily worry about it that much. We'll, we will go ahead and give normal saline to help with that, but it's not, we don't have a, a huge worry about, you know, we don't want to change this too fast. Okay, but our second um, block of sodium that we run into is when people come in and they've got this, they feel confused. And again, this is a lot of this is the elderly piece. You find this a lot in your nursing home patients and in your ICU patients. They're confused, they're unsteady, they're lethargic, they've got a bad headache. The, you know, the, the nursing home will tell you that something's just not right. They're way off. We did their labs, and their lab came back at 118. Now we're getting into a very serious level of lower sodium. We're going to have, starting to have the ATP, um, sodium, potassium pump problems. And when they start showing you, when you have sodium low enough that you are having neurological symptoms, that's considered serious and needs to be addressed. How do we take care of low sodium that's giving us neurological or, yeah, neurological symptoms? Hypertonic solution. Hypertonic? Yeah? 3%? What's a, what, how much would you give? I couldn't tell you. Any idea? Like 100 cc's? 100 cc's? How much sodium is in a, um, a regular bag of normal saline? Do you know? Point nine percent. Which is how many milli equivalents? Everything's in milli equivalents when we're dealing with um, when we're dealing with this stuff. So how many milli equivalents are in a bag of point nine percent normal saline? One hundred fifty four. One hundred fifty four. Did you see that up there? <laughs> okay. So our normal saline is one hundred and fifty four, which is just barely above what our normal level is. It will take quite a bit of sodium to kind of replete. That sodium, if we're not careful, that would be quite a fluid, fluid overload. But if we did use the 3% um, solution, how much is 3% sodium in that bag? How many milli equivalents is that? 513. That's a lot. Jesus. It's what? 513. 513 milli equivalents. That's four and a half times the normal saline dose, which means if you would normally give them a, a little old lady, you know, 100, 125 cc's an hour, well, if you're going to give her a 3%, you're going to back that down because it's a very concentrated sodium solution that you basically only give them between 30 to 50 cc's an hour and you recheck their sodium frequently. What happens when we run sodium up really too fast? Arrhythmias? You start throwing off the pumps? Um, not necessarily. What do you think? Too rapid of a correction. Seizure? Yeah. Well, you end up with this thing called demyelination syndrome, central pontine and extra pontine myelinosis. So when we give this sodium so fast, we actually cause the sodium level to rise in the, in the serum around the brain. It actually pulls in extra fluid to that tissue, and it causes demyelination of the tissue of the brain in the, in the pawns. Meaning that the neurons can get overexcited and the signals can bounce around, kind of like in an MS. They, it's not so much that they get excited. They demyelinate, like their covering yeah. comes right off. So then they have difficulty with 
conducting electricity, it's much slower conduction because they don't have the covering. Okay. And it'll be very much like MS. Okay. Yep. And you can cause that to happen. And the third factor of sodium that is important is the third, once they get below 115, these people, and most often the reason you're getting called is they're having a seizure. Who are the people that get like this? Druggies? Mm-mm. Alcoholics? Sometimes. They're not the most common. What do you think? People most... that don't eat. No? People that don't eat. About construction workers. Athletes? Is it up there somewhere? Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> nope. But it's the most common presentation of super low sodium. Somebody comes in, season their brains out. You you pick them up. You go ahead and give them Versed. It doesn't stop the seizure. You give them more Versed. It doesn't stop the seizure. Like, what the heck? What's going on? We do a quick chem 8 and we find out their sodium is 110. They're seizing because their sodium is so low. It's there are two common people that have that problem. One is psychiatric people. Yeah. It's polydipsia hyponatremia. These people, they drink and drink and drink free water until they do dilute out their serum, their serum sodium to so low that they start seizing. And it's oh. usually people that are on lithium, people that are on the antipsychotics. This is the most common reason we see sodiums below 115 with pro protracted seizures with a sodium in the 108, 109, 110, very lethal. And then the other person is somebody with a big mass in their chest. They have an SIADH syndrome, either from a mass or a head injury. Those are the people that you'll see have very low sodiums, and um, they're seizing from that. And again, they will get 3% saline, and it will be done at 50 cc's an hour, nice and slow. So that's hypo, hyponatremia. It is one of the more common things you're called for. It, it often happens in an ICU because the stressors that go with, if you're transporting a trauma patient, this could very easily be one of the byproducts of a trauma patient from a head injury for SAIDH. Post-cardiac arrest people that are still on a vent that can potentially happen, big lung masses and big pneumonias. And then, of course, the psychogenic, psychogenic polydipsia is where these people drink themselves into a sodium that's so low they're seizing their head off. And the cool thing is you bring them in, you put a Foley in them, what comes out of their body? Water. Pure water. Like as it's draining, you're like, that looks like water. And then you go do the, the um, specific gravity, and it's like 1.0001, almost water. They drank themselves to death. Questions about sodium? Okay. Okay, potassium. So, this one, most of the labs that I have here talk about low potassium, but we're all the next one's going to talk about high potassium as well. But, you know, potassium is one of those um, electrolytes that affect our muscles profoundly, right? So, potassium is one, it's, it's primarily, um, it's an intracellular ion or cation. But we have some extracellularly, and it works with the sodium-potassium uh, pumps to keep the balance up from the inside the cell and outside the cell. So potassium range, 3.5 to 5.3, and again, everybody's ranges are a little bit different. Lots of things affect potassium. Lots of things. Like what? What could make your potassium go down? Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Holy cow. Absolutely. That's like the biggest 
problem that we have with the potassium, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So they either get a GI symptom and they've got like the norovirus that's out here now. People are coming in, they've been vomiting for three days, they're blowing it out their rear end. They come in and they're like, oh my God, I can't even hold my arms up, they're so weak. I'm getting cramps in my legs, I feel tingly everywhere. Like I, without even drawing them, I can probably tell you their potassium is low. There's another subset of people that get those same symptoms. I'm having leg cramps, I'm weak, I can't pick up my arms, I feel tingly everywhere. Thousands? They're usually the other problem. I'm talking about low potassium. There's another group of people that are big into this. Runners? Uh, yeah, runners could be. Runners could be. They're not the ones I'm thinking about, but they could be. I'm thinking like the standard, like patients that will present with these things. Think 14, 15, 16 years old. Think girl. Bulimics? Yeah, your anorexics and your bulimics. Yeah. And then there's a third category, people who drop their potassium. They're elderly, and there's something that causes that. What is it? Diabetes? No. Where is potassium wasted? How does it get out of the body? Through the kidneys? Yeah. Renal failure? Not renal failure. People who have excessive urine loss. Incontinence. Oh. They have a lot of urine loss. People take Lasix. Lasix, there you yeah. go. People on diuretics. Okay. They'll have diuretics and they'll deplete their potassium. And once again, I know it's, you guys are going to be surprised to find out that you might run into an elderly person who's tired and weak. You ever run into one of those? Yeah. Yeah, That'll be new. No, I've never seen one. <laughs> Everyone we pick up, what could potentially be the problem? It could be the sodium. It could be the potassium. It could be the magnesium. It could be any of these electrolytes. I only gave you three of the most common people that drop their potassium. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, anorexics, and old people on Lasix. What happens when you have low potassium in the body? What's affected? It's all up on the screen, but you guys think about it a little bit, right? Your heart, your muscles. So it's primarily a skeletal muscle ion, cation. It's very important for skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. Very important. So obviously... Arrhythmias are going to be a big deal if you're not careful. In the sodium, um, in the potassium release for depolarization of the heart, if you, we are really low on potassium, we're not going to repolarize very well. We're not going to repolarize very quickly, which means we're going to be very slow, slow and bradycardic. So people with low potassium have a tendency to be bradycardic because they don't have enough potassium to repolarize fast enough to get ready for the next impulse. Because their sodium, because their potassium is low, their T waves are often flat, kind of like their affect. I'm tired. I'm weak. My heart's slow, and my EKG shows me flat T waves. I'm putting my money on the fact that I probably of low potassium. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. One point to make, when you start doing critical care, you get the labs from the ICU where you're doing a transfer out of the Giles ER coming down here, and then you pick up the labs and you go, oh, this person's potassium is 2.4. They go, yeah, we've been given the potassium, oral potassium, and we rechecked it, and it's staying at 2.4, and so we put some up in the IV, and you have an IV running with potassium, and they recheck the potassium, and it's still running low. Why is that? It's because they're not, when you replete potassium, you have to make sure they have appropriate magnesium. Those two chemicals go together. So if I have low potassium and I have low magnesium, I'm not going to be able to hold the potassium without the magnesium. 
So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Then you look down this thing and you go, oh, potassium is 2.4, magnesium is 1.2. I see where the problem lies. And that's when you would ask for, can we get some magnesium to hang as well? Because that will help hold the potassium and they go together. Potassium is one of those things that it can be given orally. It's absorbed fairly easily throughout the belly, but if you've got somebody who's vented or somebody who's really sick, it has to be given slowly. Because you know potassium is the drug that when you give potassium to, give it to um, people on death row, you give an IV bolus, boom, it surrounds the heart, heart completely goes flatline, they're dead. That's what happens when you give potassium too fast. So when you're, if you're going to carry somebody with potassium in a bag, you've got to make sure that you're not getting more than 10 milli equivalents per hour, and they have to be on a heart monitor. 10 milli equivalents per hour, they have to be on a heart monitor, because we just talked about what can happen. Now, it can be given in a peripheral line for a period of time. They prefer to be in a central line, but let me tell you, if you've never had potassium IV, you're going to wish you never did. It is the most painful medication to get through a peripheral IV. Why is that? It's it very it caustic burns, to the lining. Burns the muscle. So while it's there, the, mu the, uh, really the, the uh, vein. Yeah. And people will tell you, my God, this is burning awful. And it doesn't matter how slow you slow it down. Generally, they put 10 in 100 mLs, and it goes in a central line that way. If they don't have a central line and they're sending it with you, 10 in 100 mLs and it's going on the peripheral IV, you may have to only run that at 20 or 25 an hour. Sometimes you put an ice pack over that and that kind of takes the sting out of the IV. Sometimes you have to hang an additional IV bag and piggyback it so it's being diluted as it goes in. But it's very, very caustic. But in a peripheral line, it can't, you can't do a lot of them that way, but it cannot go more than 10 an hour milli equivalents. And that's in our protocols and policies too. I was hanging on the day room. Fun fact, because I had a call come back for that. Ah. Fun fact. Yep. No so, the, so the most you'll ever see in a big large bag, a lot of times they'll send a liter bag with 40 of K, is the most you should get in a large bag. And essentially that will run over 200, 250 an hour. And that's still 10 milli equivalents an hour, right? It's just diluted out much better, so you can do that. But either either way, they still have to be in a heart monitor. Right? Right. All right. Let's do some hyperkalemia stuff. So hyperkalemia, what is that value? Greater than, greater than five. five. Okay, greater than five. And when do we care about it? When the patient's symptomatic. Like what kind of symptoms? Like... Older mental status, peak T waves. Just um, rhythm, any other rhythmic maybe? Okay. For our purposes, we are going to be, we want to get them long before they have a lot of those other symptoms. We want to, we care about hyperkalemia when their EKG says you care about hyperkalemia. So they could be looking completely normal and you get called to the nurse at home for, a, let's say, a transport. And you say, really? What was the abnorm abnormality? And let's say, well, the potassium was 7.8. And you go, what? So the first thing you do is go to the patient to make sure. And they'll say, yeah, those were drawn two days ago. This thing could be at 9 by this point. So the first thing you want to know is, how is the heart handling this? How do we know? We do a 12 lead. And what does a 12 lead tell us? Well, we have hyperkalemia. We have... Peaked T waves. Hyper T waves. We have peaked T waves. They look like a pointy hat, like if you were to sit on it, it would bust your hemorrhoid. All right? They're usually in the V1 through V6 leads, and they're usually taller than the QRS, and they're not rounded in any way. They're pointed. And by that, it's telling you, I do not like having all this potassium surrounding my heart. Please help me before I go into VTAC or and die or asystole right so the EKG is the very first thing you get and if the EKG looks good 
and, this, and they says the potassium is 7.9. Now we got to wonder, maybe this is hemolyzed. Maybe it's not even real. Because what happens when you, when you draw labs and you draw them wrong and you burst open the red blood cell, or you burst open the blood cells? The lysosomes release all of the chemicals and waste into... As well as... But it would be in the tube this time. As well as potassium. potassium. That is the second highest cation intracellularly that we have. So when the cells break open, potassium is released into the bloodstream and or into the tube, and you have high potassium, that's where it's hemolyzed. Hemolyzed means that all of the blood cells opened and the potassium released, and we've got, un, um, we got uh, lab values that are off. Now, there's a quick way to check that. Any idea how to check that? to see if it's a hemolyzed specimen without it being written on the bottom, hemolyzed. There's another set, you nope, know, there's another set of labs that you can look at that if your potassium is hemolyzed, something else is, they go together. So, magnesium? Magnesium. Mm -hmm. It's the AST and the ALT. Oh. Okay. The enzymes from the liver. If your potassium is high and hemolyzed, those will also be elevated and hemolyzed, and they kind of go together. It's another way to cheat. Don't tell everybody I'm giving you all my cheating. Don't, I'm, I'm only giving it to this group. All right? <laughs> but if you have a 7.9 and all the rest of the labs look perfect, that's probably a real potassium. All right. So how do we treat hyperkalemia? When we see it, we got, we got to do something with it, right? We got to. Because we don't know where on the continuum of I'm from normal to lethal, I'm somewhere in here, and I want to get them back this way. What's some of the treatments we have to do? D50. D50. Okay. So if you give D50, does D50 in itself help hyperkalemia? No, but with insulin. <laughs> no. Right. So the insulin and the D50 go together as one treatment. So if you're not carrying insulin, then D50 won't help us. Because D50 is there to counteract the insulin. What does insulin do? It metabolizes the sugar. The cellular metabolism, so it uses the sugar, and then you provide the sugar there for it to use. No, I thought the D50 helps the potassium go back in the cell and, and you get the insulin. The no, insulin oh. carries sugar into the cell to metabolize it. Not sugar, I mean the potassium. Insulin. Insulin takes potassium into the cell by increasing the sodium potassium pump and the utilization of sugar. And I have a little uh, picture, I'll show you why that works, but that's what insulin's for. The insulin will move the potassium into the cell to temporize the cell wall of the heart so we don't have irritability. The D50 is to counteract all the sugar that it's pulling in and using so we don't drop our sugar. All right? What else do we use? You said something. Dumpling full of albuterol. Albuterol. So why albuterol? I don't actually know why. It's bad. Somebody just told me once, and I was like, okay. Okay. I don't actually know why. Okay, we'll get there. What else? What do you think, Andrew? What else? Hyperkalemia. This is all basic paramedic. This isn't even critical care. Yeah. This is basic paramedic treatment. You find somebody sitting in their home with peaked T waves, really, really peaked T waves, who is pretty sick, and you're pretty sure that this is it's a dialysis patient, it's a diabetic who's got very high sugars, and you look and go, holy cow, there are three treatments you got to pull right out of your rear end. Bicarb. Bicarb is one. So the albuterol, we've got calcium. Alb albuterol is two. Calcium chloride. Calcium gluconate or chloride. So let's let's review what about quickly. Lasix? I'm sorry? What about Lasix? Uh -uh. No. Nope. Well Lasix later, but that's not for us to do in the in the field. And that may be one of those things at some point, depending on what's causing their hyperkalemia, may be useful. Because we just said if people that are on Lasix often they have trouble with their potassium. So then we know that it will help waste it. So why does calcium gluconate or calcium chloride work? Why does calcium, why do we give calcium gluconate 
first, because as you can see from my chart, treatments for hyperkalemia, the very first thing we give is calcium gluconate. We want to give a whole gram, but we want to give it over 10 minutes. And you want to make sure it goes over 10 minutes because this stuff makes people very nauseous. But why are we giving this first before anything else? Muscle relax. No, that's fine. Nope, that's not what that does. You're close, though. This is standard paramedic treatment, right? Okay? So what it does is it antagonizes the cardiac conduction abnormalities, meaning... That it blocks the K from causing the P T waves. That's correct. It puts a barrier between the potassium that's floating in the bloodstream and puts a barrier around the heart to protect the heart during the conduction to prevent it from, like, stopping. So it's basically a heart stabilizer while we figure out how to get the potassium out of the way. So that's why we give it first. We want to stop all the abnormalities that are happening, and we want to start stabilizing the heart muscle so we can get the next treatments. Now, why do we give sodium bicarbonate? The buffer. No. Well, that's really good because that's what people think. It kind of is a buffer, but that's not what we're using it for. Sodium bicarbonate is negative in calcium. Yeah, potassium is positive. That's what I was saying. If you're acidotic, you Pop. could be hyperkalemic, right? Okay. So if you increase your bicarb, you'll decrease your hydrogen ions. You'll excrete your hydrogen ions, right? No? No. But that's close. So a lot of people get really hung up with this whole sodium bicarbonate and the buffering system and in fact it it, it really doesn't have anything to do with buffering in this particular case it has to do with the fact that once you give a sodium load and a bicarbonate load once you have too much bicarbonate on one side of the cell it wants to be on the other side of the cell so and the one thing you need to remember is potassium and hydrogen they go together everywhere hydrogen goes potassium goes so if I take the sodium and the bicarbonate, which is HCO3, and that gets pushed into the cell because I have too much on the outside and not enough on the inside, as it goes in, it's going to take some, that H is going in, it's going to take a potassium with it. So sodium bicarb basically increases the pH by taking that, so, that um, hydrogen with the bicarbonate into the cell, which drags the potassium with it. Then what's left over? The sodium. Just sodium? And you have a huge sodium load. So it draws in the bicarbonate itself, not just like the hydrogen. Does it break it apart? No. Nope. Okay. No. Nope. Sorry, I was confused for a second. Yep, that's okay. All right. So we give calcium first to stabilize the blood, the, the, the tissue wall of the heart to prevent any arrhythmias. We then give the bicarbonate to start redistributing potassium into the cell. All of this is temporary. All of this. And then in our case, we will continue to give albuterol. I don't even know which way it's going. And how albuterol works is that it stimulates the sodium potassium pump to help redistribute potassium into the cell. And, what, and as you're doing this treatment, you'll actually watch the T waves come down right in front of you. I mean, it literally will happen in 10 minutes. That's how quickly this happens. So you've got to give one albuterol, and you just got to keep giving them back to back to back to back to back to back. Don't put them all in one. Do one so you can have a long, continuous one, and just keep adding as it empties. Would you say to dilute it a little bit to make it last a little longer? Nope. Straight? Nope. Just what you have. Yours is already diluted out okay. to 3 cc's, 2.5 milligrams. That's perfect. You just want to give them back to back. All right. And then once they come in and we realize that they've got the <clears throat> hyperkalemia, we'll probably, if we, if we have to, we can probably get them on um, hemodialysis to clean that out. <clears throat> All right. So the most common people that have this, who would that be? Most common people that would have the hyperkalemia. <coughs> yep. We talked about that being the possibly an athlete. No, those are. Well, never mind. I'm sorry. 
Hyperkalemia of the dialysis patients. Very often a dialysis patient. Very often. The other people that get this are people that are on other types of um, uh, blood pressure medicines that also affect the kidneys like lisinopril. Like you'll all of a sudden see somebody who has no known history. You'll pick them up and they have the hyper peaked T waves and you find out later on they're on lisinopril and they're in renal failure because of their medicines. So they, it's mostly renal failure type people that get themselves into this trouble. The second kind of person that will get themselves into a hyperkalemic situation are your diabetic, ke diabetic ketoacidosis people because obviously they have acidosis in the bloodstream which means it pulls potassium from the cells but <clears throat> one of the things you don't want to do with a DKA patient with hyperkalemia is you don't want to aggressively treat their potassium. Okay, if they have peak T waves, you might have to bring it down a titch, but we don't want to over-treat them because what kind of medicine is a DKA going to be on? Insulin. They're going to be on an insulin, insulin drip, which is going to drop our potassium as we continue to hydrate and as we continue to treat them. So if you lower their potassium on them, and then you hang insulin. Now you got to chase your potassium by giving potassium IV. So it's not, you don't treat it all the same way. But certainly, your diabetics, you find a diabetic in cardiac arrest who's got a high blood sugar. You find a dialysis patient in cardiac arrest or a dialysis patient who's sick. And you find out that they've got hyperkalemia. This is your treatment. Does this make sense? Okay. This is cool. I've never... So just to give you a, a, an idea of like how your bicarb works. So as you can see, the very first one, letter A, is your ATP and your sodium potassium pump that's kind of working together that as um, the, the body likes to keep things in an even keel, hydrogen is moving out and two potassiums will move in in order to keep the, uh, the balance as it needs to be. What's in the out, uh, um, what do you call, extracellular and then intracellular. Now, when you give bicarbonate, letter B, as I, drew, I push sodium bicarbonate into the body, you can see that I have two hydrogens attached to the bicarb on the top. And because the concentration is so strong on the outside, it's going to drag it to the inside. And at the very bottom, it's going to pull to potassium with it as well. That's the mechanism that you are using when you use potassium, uh, when you use bicarbonate to take care of potassium. The hydrogen attached to that carb, uh, bicarbonate right there, there's two hydrogens to the bicarbonate, it's going in, it's going to take two potassium with it. And that's the mechanism that it uses. If the bicarb gets used up on the inside and it wants to di um, basically move bicarb from inside to out, it'll move one of the bicarbs, HCO3 over, it'll drag a potassium with it. They go together. The K goes with the H. All right? Does that make sense? Yes. And that's a different, that's a different mechanism for bicarb than we, when we give bicarb for a tricyclic overdose, right? Because we're giving, but we always give, if you have somebody who, who overdoses on tricyclics, the, the antidote for that is sodium bicarbonate, right? Did you know that? But why are we giving the sodium bicarbonate for tricyclic overdose? For a similar, like you just said, a similar mechanism of this to help. No, it has nothing to do with any of this. And that's why it's so important that you guys understand your medications. The reason you give bicarbonate in a, potass in a, uh, TC over a TCA overdose is because the kind of medicine that a TCA is. A TCA medicine is a sodium channel blocker. So why are you giving bicarbonate? You're giving them a sodium load on the sodium bicarbonate molecule to override the, the, the blockade. It has nothing to do with the bicarb part. So you can't use, you can't use the term sodium bicarb as the, all, all, the one drug that covers so much because it doesn't. There's lots of uses for it 
and you've got to know what you're using it for when you use it. That's why I always tell you it's not the best thing to throw in at the end of cardiac arrest because you, clearly you don't know what it is you're using it for. Right. right? Does that make sense now? We will give bicarb in the hospital. You will give bicarb as a critical care transport facility, but you will do it based on a, an ABG. That's when you'll give it. You don't use bicarb for bicarb purposes until you know what you're treating. And that's not what we do in EMS. So in this particular case with hyperkalemia, we're using the bicarbonate to move the potassium into the cell by using the, the hydrogen added to the bicarb. All right? So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense to you. All right. Magnesium, quickly. This is a tough one to kind of remember, but again, there's always ranges, but anywhere from 1.7, 1 1.6 to 2.8. Magnesium is kind of a really important um, cation as well. Why? Magnesium does the muscle relax and it balances out the K. Well, it doesn't balance out the K, but it's like a smooth muscle relaxer and it keeps everything from being too excited. It is a smooth muscle relaxer. But it doesn't work with the K. Does it work with the other electrolytes? It does. It does. So when we give it for asthma, we give it for bronchospasm. When it's given for... Um, What's the pregnancy disease that they have? Eclampsia. Eclampsia. When they give it for eclampsia, for seizures, they're giving it for smooth muscle relaxers. I'm giving it for bronchospasm, for smooth muscle relaxing, a bronchospasm. When I'm seizing from eclampsia, I'm trying to stop the skeletal activity of the clonic tonic by using magnesium. What is the chemical that causes muscle contraction? Calcium. So it's a natural calcium channel blocker. So when you give magnesium, how they think it works is that it blocks calcium from the, from the smooth and skeletal muscle and causes muscle relaxation. Magnesium works in concert with potassium. It, you cannot hold potassium in your body without magnesium. Now, the cool thing about this is that magnesium is one of these drugs that if you give it one way, it stays in the body for a really long time. And if you give it another way, it flushes out pretty quickly. So that's why it's important to understand this drug. If I'm giving you magnesium because your magnesium level is low and I'm trying to replete that and I'm trying to fix your potassium, then I need to give the magnesium slowly. So this magnesium drip rate would be one gram per hour. Now clearly if I'm going to give it for eclampsia, I'm going to give four grams an hour. But the point is it's going to be given over a big period of time. The slower you administer magnesium, the longer it stays in the body and puts its effects on the body. So consequently when we give it for asthma, we give two grams over 20 minutes. That's not going to hang around that long. But what it does is it causes that smooth muscle relaxation and the bronchodilation long enough to break the asthma, and then the rest of the medications kick in, and the body gets rid of the magnesium. It doesn't need to hold it. It doesn't need it. But in the other case, in order to keep this for the cardiovascular and the neuromuscular stuff, it really needs to be given slowly over a long period of time in order to stay in the body. Okay. You might need more than one session on this because there's a lot of information here. Um, I have 11 banked weeks, so. Okay. And so I think with this, like, we'll do the few, like I said, I only made 19 slides because there's a lot of information. Yeah. 
Um, and I think this is one that people can probably redo over and over and over before they really kind of catch it. And then if you want, we can stop to at the, where the level is where I've stopped, give that time to sink in, and then come back in and do the second half of the sheet maybe. That works. Um, if you guys are okay with that. Because this is a lot of info, don't you think? Yeah, and I can change up that schedule however we need to do it. So okay. the next week you're available is at March week. I can make that the second half of this. Or if you okay. want to keep something different and switch it up a little bit, however you want to do it. I might have another Thursday evening um, towards the end of the month. I can let you know. Okay. All right, let's do calcium. Calcium is um, one of the things I want to make sure you understand. There's two kinds of calcium. There's a free calcium that floats around in the bloodstream. And there's a calcium that's attached to the albumin. So one of the things that's really important when you pick up patients in, a, in an ICU, this is one of the labs they check all the time. This is one of the labs they check repeatedly and sometimes just give this medicine when you're hanging blood. This is a really important medication to give. And this is a very important cation to know. So calcium, it's, you can see here it says the calcium level is 1.13 to 1.32. This is what's called the ionized calcium. It is the calcium that is free and floating in the bloodstream. That is not the same as the calcium on this page that when you take a chemistry test, a, a complete chemistry test, and it comes up with a calcium of 8.9 to 12.0, that is the bound calcium on the albumin. So you've got to get to know that there are two different types of calcium. When your bound calcium, 8.5 to 12.0, is low, it may not necessarily be low because I just got done telling you that calcium binds to albumin. So with that being said then, What's the lab value I have to look at to see if my calcium is really low or not? H&H? No. We're not checking albumin. Yep, we do. Yep. Albumin is a standard lab test out of chemistry. So when you pick people up, you find a calcium of 6.8. You say, wait a minute. Let's look at the rest of the lab. Pick it up and say, where's the albumin? Oh, the albumin is only 2. Well, the albumin is low, the calcium is low. It's not really low. It's just bound to it. Correct. Well, it's just that you don't have enough albumin in the body to hold enough calcium. Right. But if you were to do a calculation to calculate it or draw an ionized calcium, you might realize that they're not low at all. That there's not enough albumin to draw to uh, bind to, so it may be floating around in the in the bloodstream. They're two different blood tests. So when somebody says, what's the calcium? And they go, 9.2, you're like, okay. What's the ionized calcium? Well, they have to go draw that and put it on ice and run it completely different, different parameters, and it's looking for something completely different. So with that being said, most places don't run ionized calciums, even though that's what it's asking for in here. It is one of those things you can ask for if you're concerned or once you start learning a little bit more about this, we can actually teach you how to calculate whether your calcium is really low or not. And again, you're looking for lows and highs on all of these electrolytes. Lows and highs on all of these have various things. So what kind of people would have low calciums? Yeah, really low calciums. Where's calcium made? Bones. Bone marrow, so cancer patients, leukemia, radiation. Okay. Is there a hormone that controls how much calcium you keep or make or free up? Menopausal women, like estrogen. There's four little buttons right around here. It's four glands right here. Thyroids. Thyroids. Para. Thyroids. Parathyroids. 
Parathyroid is what controls your calcium level in your body. So people with a big scar right here, they have a big smiley face right here, you say, hey, what happened to your neck? They go, oh, I had my thyroid out. The first question you want to know is, were they able to save your parathyroid glands? Do you have to take calcium? Are you on calcium? Most people who have parathyroid issues will tell you, I don't feel well and I think my calcium is low. They'll tell you that. Now the interesting thing here is that there is a test. You can see it on here. They have a positive trousseau sign or chopstick. I don't know what the hell it says, how you say that sign. So a trousseau sign, and I bet you've seen this but didn't know that these two went together. Trousseau sign is when you take their arm and you put the blood pressure cuff on and you go to blow it up and all of a sudden the hand does this. <gasps> That's a trousseau sign that may very well be related to low calcium. While blood pressure is being taken. I saw that today. There you go. Damn it! I thought they were in a gang, and they were like, "What's that? What's up? What's up?" <laughs> no, that's uh, that's often a sign. That's a trousseau sign. That's often a sign of low calcium. The Schofstek sign is when people have parathyroid and they know their potassium. I mean, their so their calcium is low. If you tap their cheek, just tap it with your finger, they will actually um, twitch. The face, that side of the face, and the eye will twitch. Just tapping it because they have tetany and they have excitability of that of that muscle that when you tap it it will it will um twitch on you. Kind of cool. So low calcium, you pick somebody up, you're gonna pick them up. Basically what's gonna happen is they often will you, there's the mnemonic that a lot of us use to think about is this low calcium? They have confusion, their reflexes are hyper active. I mean, when you basically touch them, they go boink. Like it's that. It's not even like a, a little, it's a big swing. It's like touch boink. Okay? It's pretty significant. Um, they will have arrhythmias. And again, tetany is a big thing that they have, especially when you take their blood pressure. Um, they can have seizures. It's all bad. The treatment for this, obviously, is to give them calcium. And we have two types of calcium you can use. So... Um, we carry, I think, calcium chloride. They recommend calcium gluconate, but you have what you have. So what's the difference between the two drugs? Do you know? Concentration of calcium? What is it? Like half. What's half? The calcium's like half as much. Where? In which one? In the gluconate. So it's a three to one, right? Calcium gluconate has or calcium chloride has three times more calcium than calcium gluconate. So it's a three time more concentration. It's better tolerated when given peripherally. Still has to be given over 10, 15, 20 minutes. I personally, if I'm not in a rush, I like to put it in a 50 or 100 cc bag and just let it take its time because people get horrible nausea from this. When you give it too fast, what happens? It says it right there. They get horrible bradycardia, horrible hypotension, and, oh, asystole. <laughs> Try not to do that to your patient. They'll talk about you. A lot of these big drugs, when you give them, if you dilute them out and take your time, you're much better off, always, than not. So the differences in the calcium. Low calcium. Your bound calcium is the one that comes in the CBC and the chemistry, the chemistries that you get. That's the bound calcium, and that's based on albumin. If I have normal albumin and I have normal calcium, everything's normal. If I have normal albumin and I have really low calcium, it's probably low. If I have low albumin and I have low calcium, it's probably normal. It's probably a pseudo-hypokalemia. If I am low, one of the best ways to check it is ask for an ionized calcium. That's your true calcium that your heart can actually work with. And if that's reading 1.0, 0.09, you are in trouble. That's the one that's floating in the bloodstream that's usable 
by the muscles to be used is this 1.13. Why do people have low albumin? What causes low albumin in a body? Liver dysfunction? It can. Oh. I don't know where I pulled that out of. Your rear end? <laughs> no, I didn't make it up. It just popped in my head. That is one. Who's the other who's the other main person that has low albumin? Oh, I can tell you this. Elderly people have low albumin a lot. Why is that? And what? Rectal bleeds. Nope. Everything starting to decrease function? Kind of. I mean it's a protein, right? Albumin is a big ass protein. And in order to have protein that works in your body, you have to eat appropriate foods. Most people that have low albumin are malnourished. They're not eating enough. There's not enough calories. There's not enough protein building material that they're taking in to make albumin. What about like vegetarians? They do get um, protein, but they get it from a plant protein. So people, they do. They may have a little bit lower, but you can sustain quite nicely as a herbivore. Why you would want to do that, being a carnivore, I don't know. <laughs> but people who are vegetarians do have normal albumins because they can get the building blocks from the plants as long as they're eating really well as a vegetarian. So, so let, me, let me ask you a question. Okay. You touched on pseudo, like pseudo seizures and stuff. Yeah. What is the best way? I didn't say pseudo seizures tonight though. No. Okay. But you know when you put pseudo with anything, what is the best way to describe what you mean by a pseudo seizure? It's not, it's not real. What you're seeing is not the actual thing. So when you have pseudo-hyponatremia, what you have is the number says my sodium is low, but I can tell you why it's low by looking at my um, sugar. And I can calculate it and tell you that it's artificially low or artificially off because of another factor. Same thing with the pseudo seizures. They're artificial seizures related to another cause, usually supertentorial component. All right? So that's the calcium. Give it slowly. Doesn't matter which one you give. It's got to be given over, it should go over 30 to 60 minutes. Be very careful with it. Make sure they're on a heart monitor. If you're not sure if it's really low, ask somebody to draw an ionized calcium. Okay. Hyperkalemia, on the other hand, is another situation. You may get somebody with hyperkalemia. Calciums that are like 16s and 18s. And you go, holy cow. And there's generally only one type of person, generally, it's not, this is not absolute, but generally there's only one type of person that gets those. And most of the time, it's related to some kind of uh, tissue breakdown. Usually, Radio? nope, secondary to getting chemo and they're lysing their tumor. It's called tumor lysis. Is that often you'll see these people, they've gotten chemo, their tumor is starting to break down and it's releasing calcium from the tumor. It's now in the bloodstream, it's now attaching and they've got horribly high calcium. Tuber lysis. Would a rhabdo cause that as well? No. Nope. Now let's ask you that. What does rhabdo cause? Rhabdo causes... What is rhabdo? Rhabdomyolysis is like a tissue destruction. Correct. And it causes like an elevated white count, an elevated lactate. It causes elevated... It elevates almost like everything. Let's talk about the electrolytes. This is where we are tonight. So when we have rhabdo, it's if, you, if you break down cells and you open up cells and let them weep out... Potassium? Potassium. They have hyperpotassium. Right? Yes. And if potassium always goes with... Well, it goes with bicarbonate. But they're, gonna they're just going to have leaking of potassium in their bloodstream. Yeah. So they're going to have elevated potassium. Now when a muscle breaks down, what's the byproduct of muscle? It's all the muscle products that you have. Lactic acid. You can't, well, you'll get some lactic acid, but that's not from muscle breakdown specifically. 
But what is muscle made out of? Protein. What kind? Amino acid. Yeah, but there's certain types that we know of. Okay. What, do I, what am I going to measure for rhabdomyolysis? Any idea? The uric acid? No. Hmm. No idea? Mm -mm. You guys ever heard of a CPK? I did. I read a paragraph about it in that book. Yeah. It was like three sentences. Yeah, we call well, we shorten it. I always say get a CK. And basically, it's creatinine phosphate kinase. It's a byproduct of muscle breakdown that when you have elevated CKs, you said CKMB, which is the heart, which we don't use, but we use CK for skeletal muscle. And once you start breaking down muscle and tissue and it gets in the bloodstream, they have elevated protein products called CK. They have elevated potassiums that will show on your um, EKG. And um, generally what will happen is that those globules of, of protein from the muscle breakdown will get stuck in the kidney, cause renal failure. So it's a big mess, right? But potassium is a big one that happens. All right. What else do I have in this little mess that we can kind of take a break on? Magnesium and then phosphorus. Phosphorus is uh, very few places draw it. I've, I think in the, probably the last month I've drawn it twice in the emergency department and both times it's yielded a woohoo for me. And mostly it had to do with the complaint that I've talked about since I've been here. Doc, I'm so tired. You're tired. I'm tired. I feel like I feel like my legs are in mud. I can't pick my arms up. I just can't get out of my own way. I feel horrible. That is the complaint. It's another one of those electrolytes. Phosphorus is very important to the body and a lot of the ATP system, a lot of energy, a lot of electrolyte exchange. So when it's off, it's a mess. So again, you're coming from an ICU. This is one of the labs they draw. They almost always draw magnesium, ionized calcium, and phosphorus, along with the regular electrolytes. So when you're going to pick up an ICU patient for transfer, you've got to look at all these to see where they sit. Most of the time when you're in the ICU, they're repleting this and calcium and magnesium on a regular basis and phosphorus and potassium. This is one of those that has to be given over four to six hours. So you may transport somebody on a potassium phosphorus or a sodium phosphorus drip because they need phos phosphorus because they're so low. And basically it's, it's basically the same kind of a thing. questions? Is there anybody out there that can hear us that has questions? Do you know? They can't hear us. It's recording, but it's not posted yet. Oh. It'll go up tomorrow. Oh, see that? What do I know? Yeah. Just follow us. Just keep talking, Doc. To do, the, to do the live action thing, they actually have to, like, call in from a Carilion facility, and we can hear everything that happens on their line, too. So, like, if they're sitting at home, and their cat and dog start freaking out, we hear it, but it comes through like times 10. Yeah, that's too oh. much. <laughs> really? That's way too much. Kids, <laughs> when you hear them come in the room, like you hear everything. Oh. So that's why we don't do that. Um, gotcha. Because they can't mute their phone. You and could, but then they forget to unmute it. Like literally, they could be talking on the phone and it sound like they were screaming, coming through on not only our end, but also on the recording end. So the other people that watch it later on. Yeah. Gotcha. Because I looked into that, and I was like, yeah. Not working. Yeah. No. So the last thing I want to say, I think, before I cut you loose, because I think you've got enough information, and I'm just going to go back to the sodium for a quick second. <laughs> there is one other reason why someone would have a low sodium, I forgot to tell you. And that has to do with hyperglycemia. And this is where we get, because thank God Art brought it up, pseudo hyponatremia is really important to understand. What does that mean? It means that they have an artificially low serum sodium because their 
glucose is really high. And what you can do is you can actually do the calculation in your head to say, you know, if their sodium is 119, you look at that going, wow, that's pretty low. Is it really 119 or is it distorted because the glucose molecule is so big that it's taking up some of that space? How do I do that? Well, your normal glucose will say for our all intents and purposes, it, normal glucose is 100. For every 100 points over 100, you add 1. 0.6 milli equivalents to your serum sodium. And that will correct it to let you know if you're close. All right, so if somebody has a blood sugar of 500 and their sodium is 126 or 125, you go, oh, this guy's got low sodium. He could be in trouble. I say, wait a minute. He's got a very high glucose. So let's calculate and make sure this is a real low sodium or it's a false because the glucose is overshadowing. So we've got 400. So we've got four 1.6s. Add basically like six. 6.6. 6.6 and add it to your 125. He's good. His real sodium is 131. His actual Sodium is 131. So he's low, but he's not as low as He's not really low. Yeah. He's no. low artificially because of the size of the glucose and what it's doing to the vasculature. But he's not like treated low and start. That's correct. Out. He's not in a dangerous low that makes me go, wow, I've got to do something else. It's just associated with this condition. That's correct. Oh, that's so cool. That is, the, that is correct. Cool. All right. Did you say it adds 1.6? 1.6. Per 100 over 100. So, you know, again, glucose of 860 with a sodium of 123 or a sodium of 125. We're basically Thanks. at a normal sodium when you look at it properly. You just got to know how to work with the numbers and understand the body and go, what is the body doing? Do you think I should do anything more? Because the next covered a lot of the electrolytes tonight. I think we covered a lot of information. Is there any other things that y'all want to cover tonight? Are there any other topics? Because while we're going to do another week of this, this will be online. There's a cheat sheet there, and we're going to do another week of this because it's so much information. So, Sorry, you know, we went over electrolytes. Our knowledge. And that was that was just a, the the main electrolytes. Yeah. Those are the ones that you will be um, addressing and attending to as a critical care transport person. You'll need to understand. You'll need to know how they work. You'll need to, the the way you replete them because you do you do transport people on a lot of these medicines that are being repleted. In understanding what they do to the body, what are the signs and symptoms? What are you looking for? What are the dangers? These are this is big. There's just so much out there. It's just, to, you know, we could keep going. I have ABGs below this. That would be a class, I bet, in, unto itself. And she has sent me some uh, cases that we could tear apart and go through to make sure you understand it. it ABGs are really not that hard, but I think people get all bald up for no reason at all. We did do some stuff with ABGs last week. I'll show you what we did real quick. If you can do the tic tac toe, it makes it a lot easier. The only thing we last week on it was I saw that. I'm not so do me a favor, put my slide back up for a second. And go down to um let's see, keep going. That's the C B C stuff. There's your bicarb. Yeah. Um I mean your uh, ABGs. I so I guess what I did so you want me to do this? We don't have to do it now. That's the only thing that we did last week was we talked about ABG some. Okay. That's the only thing we did last week. We went over those like rules of interpretation and how to what how to break one apart and look at it last week. Okay.
Because you just get thrown the numbers and people won't know where to So if, if you guys have the chance to read about this equation, this equation used to bother me, and I started calling it Joe's equation. That way it didn't sound so scary to me. But once I understood how to balance and move this stuff from side to side, the ABGs are as clear as day. Like you look at them now and you go, oh, that's not a problem. But until this makes sense to you, and I will work on that to help it make sense to you, to see how it keeps balancing, essentially the H2CO3, the carbonic acid, is the actual... Um, the uh, apex of what the seesaw will sit on and this other stuff, CO2 and water is on one side and bicarb and, and acid is on the other side and they're sitting on carbonic acid and this thing literally tips in this direction depending on what you have more of on one side or the other and it tries to make the conversion. And when you can kind of see that, then, then the rest of the ABG part makes a lot of sense so that you're not... Because I think what people fight with is the bicarbonate because it's so poorly taught in EMT and, and paramedic training that you guys just somehow get it in your head that it means one thing and it doesn't. So once you start, you give a, an ABG to somebody that's got bicarbonate, they all of a sudden get all thrown off base. Because they're like, well, there's no bicarb in the body. So it has to, they have to be acidotic. No, they don't really because you don't understand why the bicarb is missing. And this is what's going to help you understand why sometimes the bicarb is high and one time why sometimes the bicarb is low, whether it's respiratory or it's metabolic, when you understand this equation. So that's what we're going to work off of. That's what I was going to kind of work off of tonight because I didn't know how far I was going to have to go into this information, so I only prepared up to a certain point. But, um, but I really want you to get a good understanding of it because once you do it, you'll be like, I can't believe I worked this hard at this. Really. All right. Okay. I'll go ahead and hit the end button. End.